Good afternoon, everybody, and happy fall. I'm Claudia Yagubi, Director of Persian Studies and Roshan Associate Professor in Persian Literature at the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at UNC Chapel Hill. I'm so pleased to be here with you today with a fascinating panel. As you know, this academic year, we have several panels focusing on Iranian diaspora authors, their struggles, accomplishments, and ways that they negotiate their diasporic position while writing in their respective host nations. This virtual lecture series is dedicated to exploring how Iranian diaspora authors reflect on the community's attempts at carving out forms of belonging to their host nations. Authors and discussants address specific modes of power and representation that Iranian diaspora community has developed to rehabilitate their position as members of marginalized population with ambivalent feelings of belonging. Today's moderator is my friend and colleague, Dr. Parvana Hosseini, an adjunct faculty of Women and Gender Studies Department and Health Science Department at Worcester State University. And Harvane is a PhD candidate of Middle Eastern Studies and Anthropology at the University of Arizona. She has a multidisciplinary approach to research and her interests include body politics and social justice. In addition to her role as an academic researcher and instructor, she's also an advocate for women's rights and an active member of Iranian civil society. She has published several articles in International Journal of Persian Literature, Azadia and Dishe Journal, and Iran Nomad Journal. So for today, please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to post your questions and Dr. Hosseini will address as many questions as possible. Before handing it over to Dr. Hosseini, I would also like to thank UNC Persian Studies, the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, and the Center for Middle East and Islamic Studies that have co-sponsored and made this event possible. So without further ado, Dr. Hosseini, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Yabubi. I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Claudia Yabubi first, and also Persian Studies at the University of North Carolina for organizing this um, panel. Also, um, I thank uh, Mr. Dr. Hamed Ismailion for accepting our invitation to participate in this panel. I um, first introduced uh, introduce Hamed Ismailion, and then um, we start talking about um, literature in diaspora. And then um, I will ask some questions about the experience of um, Hamed Ismailion as an author. Um, as an immigrant slash exile, we go into details later. And then we will talk specifically about the novel uh, that uh, Hamed Ismailion wrote uh, when he was not in Iran and published uh, outside Iran, The Blue Token. So first, uh, who is Hamed Ismailion? Hamed Ismailion is a novelist and dentist who was born in 1977 in Kermanshah, Iran. His works include Time Is Not Fair, by Nashrev Saleh, 2008, winner of Hushango Shiri Award, The Canary Owner, 2010, um, by Nashrev Cheshmet, Dr. Dottis, 2013, again um, by uh, Nashrev Cheshmet, winner of Hushango Shiri Award. Gama Siyab Has No Fish, 2014, by Nashrev Saleh, and The Blue Token, 2018 by Nashre Mehri in, in London. Uh, in 2010, uh, Hamed Esmailion emigrated to Canada with his wife, Parisa Iqbalian, and their daughter, Rira. 
who both lost their lives on flight PS752, shot down by the Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps in January 2020. Um, I remember that uh, right before, um, it, uh, before January 2020 in uh, November 2019, Hamid uh, Ismailun wrote uh, in, on his Facebook about, um, uh, about how forgetfulness uh, is something that we should fight against because in November there were demonstrations in Iran and many protesters were uh, killed. Um, uh, he wrote that uh, one of the imp most important things that we should do is fighting against forgetfulness. Um, Ross Poulet, uh, who writes about uh, memory and specifically about uh, the, the role of memory and collective memory in historiography, uh, says a part of the difference between collective memory from history is that collective memory is not just a collection of claims about the past. It is also a source of group identity. It provides an account of the group's experience up to the present moment and even beyond present. Collective memory provides a narrative of struggle and achievement, victory and defeat in which members of the group can find their present identity. Many memoirs and novels written by immigrant Iranians are reflections of collective memories and they can be considered as sources of group identity because they provide a quote, a narrative of struggle and achievement, victory and defeat in which members of the group can find their present identity. And they provide an account of their group's existence. Pull it. Um, so let's start at, um, talking uh, with um, Dr. Esmailion. I would like to invite uh, Hamed Esmailion to um, join me on the stage. Thank you, uh, Dr. Esmailion, for accepting our invitation to join us for this panel. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to start um, our conversation with uh, mentioning that there is, uh, in, in the literature of diaspora, there is um, some differences between a writer as an immigrant and a writer in exile. Um, would you please share your experiences and thoughts with us, how you see yourself, you immigrated, you, you, I know you were if I'm not wrong, when you immigrated to Canada, you were already publishing novels and books in Iran, and you immigrated to Canada, so, and you started writing there, thinking that maybe, maybe you are not in exile, you are an immigrant. So how did you become a writer in exile, if you, if you think uh, that is true about it? Thank you very much, Dr. Hussaini. I say hello to everybody uh, and thank you and Dr. Yaqubi for inviting me here. Uh, so it's a big challenge. I mean, uh, yes, I moved to Canada 2010 as a skilled worker immigrant and uh, I already had published three or two books in Iran. And my third book was uh, in the hand of my publisher, Gama Siab Has No Fish. Uh, you have read that book. This is about politics. It is about 1980s in Iran. It is about uh, uh, all the conflicts and like civil war in Iran and the, the war that we had with Iraq. And uh, so I, I had tried to, uh, uh, you know, I had three, three uh, characters in this story. and. Uh, some of them were controversial char characters and I knew that it's going to uh, uh, cause some sensitivity among the officials of Iran. So when I gave that book to my publisher, actually I left Iran mm -hmm. and uh, but I, I didn't know that it's going to be published or not. But uh, then I heard after three months, uh, it was Ahmadinejad's era and I heard that 
uh, the book is not uh, gonna get permission from the government. And I was fine with that. You know, I, I, I was not at the stage at that time to not give any book to the Minister of Ershad, Ministry of Culture in Iran. I was like, uh, I was a young writer. And when you're a young writer, you try to publish your work. You're very eager or you're enthusiastic to publish your work as soon as possible. So that was my third book. And uh, I didn't mind actually when they said, no, it's not permitted. And I, I, I was in Canada. I worked on an, another book, Dr. Datis. And uh, so I just totally forgot about that. Uh, yes, I was here as an immigrant, but I had a chance to go back to Iran. And every time I was going back, I was thinking about those people that they can't uh, go to their homeland. And this big question that why? If you were born in Iran and you love Iran and you're out of the country, so uh, like one of the people that I was thinking about was you, Parwane, and your husband actually, and because we were friends for years, and I was going back and I'm in the airport and I'm thinking why Parwane and Merag and other people that I know they can't come back to Iran. So uh, with this question in mind, uh, uh, the, the government changed and. Uh, the new government came to power in Iran. You know that the government doesn't really matter in Iran. You know, the Supreme Leader is the owner of the power in Iran, but some, some minor things change in Iran. Like the Minister of Culture can be more ignorant about uh, the quality of the books or the words because they check the, every single word with, with their magnifier and to find like something uh, that is against uh, religion, against their uh, their rules, I don't know, against their values or whatever. Uh, so my publisher, we don't saying to me, he has given bo the book to the Ministry of Culture and uh, it was surprisingly permitted. And it got published and in, th in six months, uh, it went to the third edition, Goma Siab Has No Fish. But then I, I heard rumors that in one of the... Uh, uh, ceremonies that they had to introduce introduce the books IRGC had called and said if you introduce this book in this event we are going to come and uh, ruin the event well I went back to Iran for a funeral of my father-in-law me and Perry so we went back on 2014 I got questioned in, in there at the airport they got my passport and I didn't know what's going on. So uh, two days later, I had to go to in, in uh, uh, for, to another session for questioning what they're they doing, what do you write, talking about my books. I didn't know why I am there at, at the day that uh, it was my uh, father-in-law's funeral and I had to be with my wife. But instead of that, I was in Tehran in the passport center in the at the basement answering nonsense questions about my books and my work in Canada and in Iran and my past and everything. So I was in a dilemma at that time. I was, uh, I was able to leave the country. Uh, I was in fear that not be able to leave the country at that situation, but I left the country and I was, uh, I came back to Canada, but then I started thinking about this, that what do you want to do? You want to be able to go back or you stay here and write about what you see. This dilemma actually continued for three, four years because at the beginning I decided to stay quiet and not say anything. And then after two years, I was like, what's going on? I should, you know, what, what about your conscience? You know, you have to uh, you always, you know, in all, all of your life, you were sensitive about things going in Iran and you were reacting to that, but now you have to be silent. At the last trip that we had to Iran four or five years ago, when we came back, when I saw the situation of people in Iran, when I experienced what's, what people are experiencing in Iran, it, I went back for like two, three weeks and I didn't meet anybody, just my family, because my mom and my dad and my brother, they lived there. So I came back and I said to my wife, I'm not going to go back to Iran anymore. 
because I can't be silent, because I can't see things and uh, say nothing. And uh, at the same time, I was writing some novels and uh, then I decided to not give any books, any, any piece of work to the Ministry of Culture in Iran. I didn't want to get bullied again for one word. And uh, so uh, Blue Toucan was one of the books that I published here. And uh, I think that's a different uh, era when you get an exiled uh, writer. Uh, I mean, um, um, uh, you know, it, it comes as your identity, and this is a different identity. Uh, you'd never get a chance to go back to your country, but uh, you pay the price for defending freedom and justice, I think. Um, this is my understanding about writing in exile. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I remember how... Um... Um, you know, this is one of the connections I felt with uh, actually Parisa when his uh, father um, was very sick and when he lost, he, she lost her father and we uh, uh, communicated, um, this is our shared things, going there or not, it is not fair to feel that your dad is there and you don't have access to it, especially for us. Uh, when we think that, why should we choose between speaking and meeting our dear ones when we are losing them? Why, why should we choose one of them? This by itself is a very hard question. Um, are you, uh, have you been writing? Um, my understanding was that you believe that you wanted to publish for, you know, in Persian, for Iranians, for the Iranian audience, especially Iranians in Iran. But you were, you know, so enthusiastic. You, you, you were a writer, you were writing, uh, you, you were, you know, full of, you know, the desire to write. And how, did you uh, write anything that you didn't publish? What, what was your policy what, you know, about this? You know, I've experienced both uh, publishers in Iran and publishers out of the country. And uh, if you want my opinion, I think the right readers of the books are inside Iran. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you you know, every writer, every Persian writer or Farsi writer wants her, his books or her books to be published or to be given to the readers in Iran because they are the right people to, to read it. I don't mean they're right. I mean, they're more, you know, when I have been in uh, uh, a story, uh, like uh, reading a story sessions in both countries, in Iran and in, in Canada. And I found the atmosphere in Iran completely different. There were hundreds of people there. They're listening to you. And uh, in Canada, for example, it hasn't been so bad, but, you know, you don't see that in the young generation. They, they grow up with a different culture and uh, I don't I don't blame them that if don't, they don't write uh, Farsi books but I mean uh, the Farsi the, the readers of a Persian novels are in Iran and mm -hmm. or in Afghanistan mm -hmm. and uh, as a writer you don't want to lose that chance your book being published in Iran but for years after I uh, published Blue to Khan, uh, I, I kept writing. I have two other novels and one short, shorter story book, but uh, uh, I, I couldn't find a way to, to publish it. And I was thinking, and uh, Paris was seeing my struggle every day, and he, she was like, Homa, just publish, just do it. Just put it free on the internet. And I'm like, no, because if you're a writer, you have to... Uh, uh, get paid for what you're doing so <laughs> you have to find a way economically and your your ambition and as a writer to to give this book to a reader that wants to read it and it's very difficult for for persian writers out of iran to find a way you know amazon doesn't support farsi uh in his website and uh uh you know, to find a good publisher out of the country is very difficult. The contracts are not in favor of the writers. And uh, 
inside Iran, the same thing. Uh, and censorship in Iran, you have, you want to fight with the censorship in Iran. So it's very difficult. So I didn't publish the last three books that I had mm -hmm. written. And uh, honestly, I don't know what to do with them. Barwana. So Parisa insisted all the time, how much do it? And uh, I may, I may do it soon or late, you know, but uh, I have to edit them first and I'm not in that uh, peace of mind right now to just read them again and you have to edit it. And you have to be in, when you write a novel, you have to be in that atmosphere. You have to be in the, in the, in something that you created uh, in that uh, uh, story. You, ha you have to feel your, yourself in the story, but uh I didn't get a chance um, in the last 20 months uh, to do that. Of course, understandable. So speaking about that confusion, I want to ask, I introduced you, but it is you yourself who can introduce yourself. Who is Hamed Esmailion? Um, you are a writer in exile. You are an immigrant, an immigrant dentist. You are the husband of Parisa and father of Rira, who were uh, killed um, by Iranian authorities. Um, you are the spokesperson of the Association of the Families of the Victims of the Flight PS752. How do you put these pieces together? A uh, very difficult question, and this is a question for for the rest of the people to answer that, that uh, who is this person? Who is this guy? Who am I? I don't know. This is uh, my life uh, upended on January 8, 2020, uh, right at the moment that I heard uh, this happen. Actually, that night, before they go to Iran, uh, uh, so they went for two weeks. And uh, me and Rira, we had this conversation that she was uh, I said, Rira, do you know what I want, I'm, I'm going to do for the for the two weeks that you're not here? And she said, No doubt, what you're doing. And I'm so, I'm like, uh, okay, for the for the first night, I go to watch an NBA match uh, in Toronto, and the second night, I'm going to go see a hockey game, and the third night, I'm going to go to the pub from morning to night, and the third fourth day, I'm going to be in a theater watching every movie that I can watch with you guys because I we usually watch animations together uh, like the, as a family or the, the movies that was uh, like uh, okay with for Rira mm -hmm. and so she said what about the second week I said I will do the same thing from the beginning to then so she went to her mom and said mom do you know what what dad is gonna do and uh, uh, so she just repeated what I said and mom uh, Parisa said, oh, don't worry about him. He's going to be in front of his computer writing his book. So, <laughs> and that was true, actually. I, I worked in the, in the day, at the day for in the dentistry. And at night, I was just finishing my novel. And on January 7, 2020, I was finishing my last novel, you know, the last chapter when I heard the news. So uh, everything changed everything changed to a different world and uh, if you want you know i think one of the first duties that every person has to know himself or herself uh, uh, as much as he can and 21 months after this disaster this crime this mass murder i i don't know myself uh this confusion you remember I was I had a weblog lost in highway but now mm -hmm. it's lost in life mm -hmm. and uh, you try to find something to enjoy the life to 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 leave but it's very hard for me to find it you know the only way to find solace uh, I mean and some calmness for me is just connecting other family members the other mm -hmm. family members of flight ps752 are my own family members now mm -hmm. and i'm in touch with them like on the everyday basis i live in my with my mom and my dad but uh everything has changed you know i i was i was a person talking to my mom every every other day and asking about my dad's diabetes and his condition heart conditions things like that but now after 20 months 
even once I haven't asked my mom or my dad, that, how are you? And uh, I don't know, you think that you lose your heart or your feelings, but uh, uh, in this condition, uh, you just, uh, you're lost. And uh, it's not hard to say that some nights that when I come back, I mean, I go back to home, I can't find my home. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny for you guys, probably. The only time, you know, I find myself in a dead, dead, end, dead end street and I'm like, oh, uh, oh I, I left, uh, I, I turned in a wrong direction and where, and let's go back. And uh, the only time I can find myself, there's a time that I'm in my office, seeing my patients, talking to them when I, when I interact with people. And, uh, but when I'm alone, um, I can think forever for, about memories. When you lose someone, memories come back to you every day and every moment, and uh, it's not possible to escape from them. And uh, I can explain more about books and movies because I tried to read books and watch movies in the last 21 months. But for a person who used to read three, four books a week or listen to audiobooks every week, it's sad to say that I haven't been able to finish one book in the last 21 months. I tried uh, uh, books about Nazi, Nazis in Germany. I tried to read books about human rights activists. I tried to read books about um, uh, Pinochet, like the, one of the books of Ariel Dorfman and uh, none of them is finished. All of them are open in, in my just beside my bed. <laughs> yeah. So it's up to you to um, find who I am. I don't know. I try to uh, I try to pay attention to what happened to me and what I can do for the truth and justice. I think I think this is the most important mission that I have in my life. And I can't give up. I think that's the most important one for me. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me of, is that Wang Mei's husband that lost the way to his home many times in your book, The Blue Token? He, he, he was in a kind of like feeling, uh, where is home? Where do I belong to? All the questions that we will get to uh, that deeper when we are speaking about the Blue Token. But you said, you talked about um, how Parisa was encouraging you and uh, she knew you better than yourself that you would sit and write all the time. Um, and if I'm not wrong, recently you wrote on your Facebook that you, um, you days, you turned off uh, your cell phone and everything. And you had a kind of like imaginary dialogue with Parisa and kind of like Parisa was convincing you to go back to your writing. I wanted to ask about challenges you are experiencing. You already talked about it, but you think that, you know, I feel like you are speaking, you are talking to Parisa and Parisa is still kind of trying to convince you to, because it is part of you, it is, it is you, it is. So would you like to, if you don't mind, um, speak about that kind of like what the, your challenges and what, what may help you in this struggle? Yeah, she was not only my wife, she was my best friend uh, for 20 years. And 22 years, I can tell you, it's 22 years that we were friends. And uh, every night I had to tell her the stories of the day, and especially the stories that, uh, about Iran, that what has, what was happening in Iran, about the people that got killed in Iran, the people got prisoned in Iran. And uh, she was just listening to me. And uh, I, I remember... Uh, we have, I had a friend, you remember, probably you remember him, Kurosh Asadi, uh, a writer who committed suicide in Iran. And I was, at the time that Kurosh uh, committed suicide, like four years ago, I felt so bad. I couldn't sleep for, for 30, 40 days. And Parisa was worried about me. And one night I said, Parisa, you know, if I die, you know, this publisher would be the good one to publish my books, this one and this one. And like a year passed and one night she woke up all of a sudden and she said, oh my, what was the name of the publishers? And <laughs> so 
I laughed. I said, Paisa, you want me to die? You know, she said, no, you just said that to me. I need to remember that. So I have this conversation with her all the time. Uh, and I feel guilt guilty about lots of things. Uh, not guilty about what happened to you know why she left back to iran for 12 days why uh ukrainian flight why you know i don't think about this stuff i think about my du duty against the government or the regime of iran this is the this is where that i feel guilty and uh i think uh i in my whole life i have never been silent about iran even when i was in iran i was writing that like no to violence or things like that. But I think we should have stepped up before, years before this uh, nightmare continues in Iran, like in 1980s, in 1990s, in like 2007, great movement. And, you know, in all those occasions, we try to not be silent, but we didn't really fight. We didn't really fight with this regime. And then after PS752, they executed Navid Afkari, they killed Bahnam Mahjoubi, they killed Ruul Azam. They, you know, two days ago, ago they killed Shahin Nasseri in the prisons of Iran. And this is the price that our people pays because of our silence. And I think if everybody feels as outrageous as us, the victims of uh, like uh, Iranian regime, uh, I think this injustice is going to end. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel guilty about that. And to fight with this injustice, you have to document the crimes. And the best way to do that is to write about it. And when I was in uh, uh, Rocky Mountains one day, I had this conversation with Paris and I'm like, okay, I have to write a book about you. I haven't started yet, Parmane, but uh, as soon as uh, I find two weeks, I'm going to sit down and finish that book. It's all in my mind. Mm, okay, yeah. that's that's um, good news. Um, and I'm happy that Parisa was able to convince you to do that. Uh, looking forward to reading it. Um, and yes, I so agree that the you know documenting and writing our narratives of how you know, we are the history we should not wait for historians three years later to write about us with the glasses they wear um this is our history and we are history and it is our narratives that should be uh, documented um we are in such a hard time um all together hopefully um so Thank you very much. Uh, I, how about now? I want to uh, go more specifically uh, into uh, talking about the Blue Token, uh, which you published uh, outside Iran 2018. Um, let me um, say that, that I have recently written an article about uh, the Blue Token, uh, about the concepts of um, literature in diaspora, including home and return and identity um, in uh, the Blue Toucan. Uh, it will be published in Iran Namak very soon, along with some other articles that my friends and colleagues have written in uh, about, again, literature in the diaspora about different books. Um, I would like to introduce uh, the blue token now, and then uh, we will be uh, glad if you can read a part of it for us. And then we will go on talking about uh, the blue token more in detail. So uh, I don't want to spoil this story, but it is, I, know I will talk, uh, I will just uh, mention what the blue token is about. Bahman and Simin vote for Musavi in 2009 presidential election in Iran. Since Bahman was an active uh, member in Musavi's campaign, when they learned that his friends are being arrested one by one after the election and put in jail, they flee Iran and escape to Turkey, 
and eventually um, end, um, end up taking refuge in Canada. Simin begins to build a new life as an immigrant, but Bahman struggles with his past and with the death of his mother that happens when they are away from Iran. His only acquaintance who becomes his closest friends in a, uh, is a half imaginary Chinese refugee woman named Wang Mei. Wang Mei has lost his son in China in a demonstration. Wang Mei stood up for seeking justice after the death of her son. That is why I, her own life along with her husband's life and they had to flee their homeland. Wang Mei is in limbo in Canada. She desperately, Wang Mei wants to turn home country and reach his son's grave. Transforming into a token refers to a, a Vietnamese myth. Simin gets suspicious of Bahman's strange behavior and convinces him to talk to an Iranian therapist. The therapist himself has fled Iran right after the revolution. His visits with Bahman and Simin reminds him of his past and himself. The characters become the narrators of each chapter of the novel. Through the chapters, the themes of the story connects with essential key concepts of immigration and exile. One of the key concepts of the novel is a situation between sleeping and death in which the soul of the person transforms into a bird that is the blue toucan and flies toward the homeland. The hybridity of this situation represents the uncertainty and fluidity of the immigrant identity. Um, so here I would like to invite Mohamed Esmailion, if possible, to read a chapter of the Blue Toucan. This would be in Persian. Um, um, I, uh, I, I know that you know many of the participants wanted to hear a part of the novel in Persian, even the English speakers, because it is literature and the, and the, you know the originality of uh, Persian language for this novel is something that everybody would appreciate. Um, um, we can hear you. Thank you, thank you. So as you said, there are three characters: Bahman, Simin, and Farid. So I'm gonna uh, read the part six of the section one, 1390. Uh, this is Bahman's narrative. Man buy murda haram mi fahmam. Madaram kif mord fahmidam hamon ruz. Adam mi fahmat, shir fahm mi shavat. Hich kas montazer marg maman nabud. Taraf saratan daskoy guvarish darad ya chemi daram porustat ash chekke mi konad va aqabat ash vazo maalum ast. تو منتظری از این ماه با آن ماه از این سال با آن سال یا شاید از این بیمارستان تا آن بیمارستان تو گریه هایت را کرده ای هیکل نحیف محتضر را می بینی و می دانی امروز فردا می افتد می میرد حتی وقتی با هم از بیمارستان برمیگردید و پشت سرش راه می روید حالت دست هایتان یک طوری است که اگر رو به عقب افتاد بلا فاصله او را بگیرید و نگذارید مغزش روی زمین پخش و پلا بشود اما مامان مامان حتما خودش بیشتر از همه غافل گیر شد مامان از دوری ما دخ کرد حتما از دوری ما دخ کرد من و مهرداد و مهرانا به روز آخر مامان فکر می کنم به روز مرگش کی خبر دارد هیچ کس مامان هم استثنا نیست به خودم می گویم حتما صبح زود شش و نیم هفت مثل همیشه در پارک اسعدی قدم زد همانطوری مان توی سرمه ای به تنش با روسری سیاه که زیر گلو گره زده دستهایش را پشت کمش به هم رسانده و با یکی مچ آن یکی را گرفته است و همانطور که بر سنگ ریزه های وسط پارک پا میگذارد حواسش پرت می شود فکر کنم آن روز صبح حواس مامان مثل همیشه پرت شد به قطره های آب روی چمن و آب پاش باغبان که همیشه می گفت خیلی پیر است و غصهش را میخورد حتما کمی جلوتر همانجا در پارک انگشت ها را در هم حلقه کرد و دست ها را کشید بالای سر و بعد رو به جلو فشاری به بازوها آورد و درد را در عمق گردنش دنبال کرد به قول خودش ورزش در حد قهرمانی 
حتما خانم منتظری و بالازاده آن موقع همراهش بودن بعد از نرمش و سلام و علیک به آن همه پیرمرد و پیرزن نشست باز نشسته و کم حوصله یک ساعتی هم در پارک نشستند و غیبت کردند در مورد محمد آقا دریانی که تازگی سگ اخلاق شده و به خانم بالازاده گفته شما ماست را باز کردی و خوردی و بعد پس آوردی یا فیروزه زن پسرم هم که طلاق میخواهد و رفته خانه پدرش و کسی نمیداند دردش چیست درباره گل شمدانی همسایه بالایی که آب از گلدانش به راه پله شره میکند یا فلان سریال تلویزیون که هنرپیشش در نقش زنی تنها و گریان گل کرده است حتما بعد از یک ساعت راهشان را گرفتند و به طرف خانه رفتند او را می بینم که از جلوی باجه مطبوعاتی رد شد نگاهی هم حتی به روزنامه ها نکرد و خودش را گرم گفتگو نشان داد و بعد کمی پایین تر سر کوچه شقایق از بالازاده و منتظری جدا شد آنها پی سبزی و نارنگی یا پرتقال تازه به خیابانی که به بازار میوه و تر و بار میرسد رفتند و مامان وقتی مطمئن شد دوستانش او را نمی بینند کمی از مسیر را هر وله کنان برگشت و بدو بدو کنان خودش را کشاند جلوی باجه مطبوعاتی و آنجا طوری ایستاد انگار 25 سال از آنجا ایستاده است خبرها و تیتر روزنامه ها را خواند احتمالا یاد من افتاد او را می بینم که یاد من افتاده است وقتی خم می شود و دستش را روی زانو ستون می کند تا تیتران روزنامه های ردیف آخر را بخواند. حتما یاد من افتاده است یاد من و مهرداد و مهرانا حتما دید همه چیز مثل گذشته است هیچ چیز تغییری نکرده است تبعیدی ها تبعیدی و ادامی ها ادامی تیتر های سیاه و سفید با مطالبی معمولی عکس سیاست مداران و گزیده کلمات قصارشان پاراجور های رو روی روزنامه ها یه برای پاراجرهای روی روزنامه ها برای اینکه باد نبردشان تک و توکی برای خرید سیگار به باجه سر میزنند روزنامه اما هیچ فقط باد آنها را ورق میزند احتمالا خبرهای ورزشی را هم دنبال کرد و وقتی دید فوتبالیست های میلیونر باز و پروپای هم پیچیدن نیشخنجی زد و روزنامه نخرید و بعد راست و کوچه نیلوفر را گرفت و سر شقایی از محمد آقا دریانی شیر خرید یا شاید هم پودر لباسشویی که میگفت قرار از قهد شود به خانه رسید بابا هنوز خواب بود فکر کنم وقتی رسید و عباس و مریم هم زنگ زد خورش قیمهش را بار گذاشت کمرش خورد به لبه ماشین لباسشویی که بدجاز و دلش قش رفت کیسه لیمو همانی را از کابینت پشت یخچال برداشت و چندتایی در بشقاب انداخت تلویزیون را روشن کرد کورتونولش را در دست گرفت و همان موقع همان موقع بر یکی از راحتی های حال همان که رو به تلویزیون بود و رنگ و روی دستش رفته بود رو به روی تمثال حضرت علی و آن وان یکاد کوچک کنار میز اصلی که همیشه سه بشقاب تمیز و سه چنگال روی آن بود نشست و یکی دو دقیقه بعد سرش روی شانش خم شد و رفت که رفت مریم میگوید ظرف خورش روی گاز بوده من حتم دارم خورش قیمه بوده است همین بوی سوختگی خواب بابا را شکسته است حدس میزنم مامان فکر میکرده جارو برقی را به برق بزند بلکه بابا بیدار شود یا شاید هم فکر کرده بابا را راه بیاندازد بروند طرفی جای دلشان باز شود و با زیادش آمده از پنج و شش میتواند بیاید در اسکایپ و مهرانا را ببیند و امروز پنج شنبه است و مهرداد باید مدرسه برود بابات هیچ ساعت را نگاه کرده و هشت ساعت و نیم را جمع و تفریق کرده و دوباره فکر کرده است ترکیه چقدر اختلاف ساعت داشت کانادا چقدر اختلاف ساعت دارد و عاقبت وسط همین فکرها بوده که آدم نمیتواند مردن مادرش را جار بزند اگر بخواهد در شبکه های اجتماعی هم بغض کند ممکن است تو خط بنویسد مادرم مرد خانه خراب شدیم یا ای وای مادرم بعد ریسه کامنت ها و تسلیت ها و بعضی هم که پرتند و لایک میزنند آن وقت اگر آدم بخواهد نفرتش را بیزاریش را اندوهش را در این تنهایی جیغ بکشد فریاد کند آن هم از این راه دور بهتر است به جای مزخرفاتی چون فیسبوک و همسال هم سرش را در بشکه چیزی فرو کند و آنقدر نعره بزند تا هم صدایش خش بردارد و خفه شود هم دلش را با خودش صاف کند مادر تازه مرده بود مامانم بود مادر عزیزم مامان صدایش میکردم ولی دوست دارم بگویم مادر مادرم دوست دارم احترامش را نگه دارم الان که مرده حتی بیشتر داستان کاناپه را برای تان آن روز در مطر تعریف کردم I think that's enough, Farwana. It can go more than this, but uh, so that was my part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for um, reading an excerpt of your book, The Blue Toucan. Again, The Blue Toucan uh, was published um, by Nashra Mehri, and it is available uh, outside Iran and in Iran. So if you uh, if anybody is interested to read the whole book, 
um, it is available. Um, we want to talk a little bit more about the Blue Toucan. Um, uh, if you allow me, I would like to speak a little bit about a part of my analysis of uh, the Blue Toucan, uh, a part which um, for me is very unique and important, the Blue Toucan. Um, to be short and precise, I read it. In the Blue Toucan, body has a central role, body. Uh, the novel starts with pointing to Bahman's large and warm hands. But body in this novel is marked with wounds and wounds or warns of the horrific future. Whatever the wounds are, they are the points that connect humans together, a shared pain that calls out for one another. Bahman's hands relate to Jesus' hands that is going to be punctured by nails and crucified. Wang Mei also is, is a, who is the mirror character of Bahman in the novel has a deep wound that opens up from the very top of her head and runs all the way back to the back of her neck. A wound that as Bahman explains is still open and from time to time in blood the drops from it. Here the concept of body studies of Brian Keith Axel, who studies diaspora in the field of anthropology. Axel uses the symbol of an online sphere called Khalistan made by Sikhs from India who live in exile to introduce the term diasporic imaginary. In Khalistan, the images of bodies are central also. There are two kinds of bodies in Khalistan, bodies which are unharmed and intact, and bodies which are injured, tortured, and dead. Axel argues that in this context, the injured bodies represent the homeland in its violent condition at present time and the person in diaspora in relation with his or her homeland. In the Blue Toucan too, the injured body is meaningful. Um, I, I would not uh, continue, the, I, I, I have written about this and explained in my article that how these bodies and these wounds are important uh, in this novel and, uh, and how it, 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 they represent um, our time and um, sadly the, that horrific uh, future that the wound uh, is predicting happened and uh, is it still happening. Um, an excerpt, uh, excerpt of the book, the, this is from the Blue Toucan, um, my translation, uh, just a short part. The baby was asleep, of course, but I was not longer scared of Wang Mei, not even scared of the deep blood dripping gash that went from the crown of her head down to her neck. Yes. It is split open. The wound has not, the, the blood has not clotted. Now and again, it drips blood, but it is not frightening. It comes from her fall. Um, well, let's talk about the blue token. Wang Mei and Bahman in this, uh, Wang Mei is the um, Chinese refugee woman and Bahman is the um, young man who uh, immigrated uh, and took exile, uh, refugee in Canada um, after the green movement I mentioned very, very short uh, earlier. Wang Mei from China, Bahman from Iran, become very close. Um, actually, I, I, my understanding is they are closest friends and they do, not, mm, they do not know, feel very close to the people of their own countries. Uh, why so? Why are Wang Mei and Bahman from two different countries so close and far from the people from their own countries? When you live in a cosmopolitan city like Toronto, you see people from different nations. <laughs> and. Uh, I got curious about other nations when I was here, like 10 years ago, nine years ago, before I uh, write this book. 
And I realized that the China and Iran, uh, they almost had a, you know, had the same history. I mean, the, the, the efforts for having freedom and justice in Iran is almost at the same time that is happening in China. The constitution movement uh, in Iran, the 115 years ago, it's almost coincident. Uh, I mean, at the same time that uh, 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 Chinese people, they try to ch uh, have a change. And mm. then, you know, writing novels for me is like a project. So I have to buy like 40, 50 books and read them and just um, like improve my knowledge about China connections between Iranian and Chinese. And I did that, you know, I, I read about Mao, I, I read about communism after uh, what happened uh, to Jiang Kai-shek, for example, 100 years ago, and the nationalists in China and the uh, big parrot in China before the revolution and all of that. And I f felt that, uh, you know, the victims of Tiananmen can be very similar to the victims of the after grief movement or the victims of like the writers that they were executed in Iran or uh, all the victims of the Iranian regime. I mean, they just, uh, when, you, when you know about Tiananmen that the China wanted to go to a different phase from communism to like communism, capitalism, something like that. And the, the students were sensitive about that and they were protesting and they were objecting this. And at the beginning, the army was cooperative and the government was, but in one morning, they just decided to kill everybody. And it remember, you know, it reminds me Hashemi Rafsanjani in Iran and Khamenei together, they decided to bring Iran to, to a capitalism at the end of the eighties that uh, uh, the, the development era in Iran, we call it, but it's just the, the era that completely ruined the country about, about the dams that they made, the roads and everything, the, the way they ruined the environment in Iran. It just started at the end of 1980s. And this is a similarity between these two countries. I mean, China went a different direction, but Iran went a different one. And, but I see that similarity in between the victims that... The, the victims of Tiananmen had no voice the same way in the world, the same way that the victims of Iranian regime had no voice so far. We have heard a lot about Chileans, Argentinian moms, uh, Rwanda, other countries. I know millions of people got killed in Rwanda, but I think this is not the same way that we hear from China and Iran. And this is our fault, I mean to write more about China, I mean, Iran, especially the victims of the Iranian regime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry if this is a tough question, but um, how do you see uh, your relationship between, I mean, Hamid Esmail Dion's re relationship between you and Wang Mei, who has a, um, in, in some ways similar past, she loses uh, her only child. And then she just, the only thing that she wants is seeking for truth and justice. But, but you wrote this book before, what happened to you? How, how do you see your relationship with Wang Mei? Honestly, uh, after this happened to me, it surprised me as well. But I was not aware of what I wrote because the book was not in my mind. But after like a year when I, I was just checking my books one day and I, I, I read about, I read it that Wang Mei tried to connect with other families to, to just ask authorities of what happened and then leave the country for justice and it just surprised me that the, almost the same thing happened to me I don't know if it was a prediction and that's one of the reasons that I hated literature honestly <laughs> I said you know <laughs> what you could have written about something else and they just yeah. you had the, the same destiny that your character had but, uh, you know, you have to wait for this uh, because one may wait it long enough in Canada and seek ju justice. And that happens to her at the, at the end of the story. But for me, I'm just in the second year. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I don't know my, you know, it depends on my destiny, what happens to me after a year, two years, three years, then you can judge the similarity of the characters. But that's unfortunate. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I felt, you know, I had sympathy all my life um, with the victims' families. And uh, this is my um, fate now to be one of them. Um, you uh, mentioned a part of your novel that I already have it here, and I, if it, you don't mind, I would like to read a little bit of it. One may loses her child, but after a while, she goes after justice and does not give up. She asks round, around to find out where and by whom was her son killed. She writes to the courts and asks for meetings with the judges, speaks to the military and asks them, how is it that you and the protesters were in one uh, another's arms and suddenly on June 3rd, so easily brought the tanks? She loses face on the party members. Why did you follow Jiangping and Jiang, uh, uh, correct me if I'm not pronouncing them correctly, uh, Jiu Zing's orders? Why, do you, why did you kill our children? She goes again and again to the university, contacts the parents of the other killed students, which happened to be thousands. Some reply, some do not. Through a few middlemen, she hears from a witness that Jimmy, her son, was shot on Tian Main Street and fell down. Um, in the literature uh, in exile, a very important concept is return. That is actually return is actually one of the things that separates, uh, you know, immigration from um, from exile. The desire to return and the, you know, how it is impossible to go back to home and home land. Um, in the blue toucan, the return is represented by transforming into a soul slash bird. The blue toucan. Um, what are what is your thoughts as Ahmed Ismail Yun at this moment uh, about the concept of return? Um, you know, in your, yeah. I think this is a kind of uh, a myth among the Vietnamese. I'm not sure about that. I remember that I saw that in a documentary years ago that, uh, uh, you know, this, this desire to go back, to go to your homeland uh, exists, you know, uh, among all the nations and uh, all the people that live in exile. And when you don't have the power to change the regime or the government uh, or the up, you know, to remove the obstacles on your way to going back, then what is your other way? So uh, uh, this is this is what came to my mind that you know you can turn to a bird and just fly back home. Mm-hmm. And I know that there are two, there are one ocean on your way, but. Uh, it might be possible. I don't know. And I made I made this story about the blue toucan that is not a it's an imaginary bird mm-hmm. that uh, uh, I found it fascinating for to to play this role to uh, uh, go back to the homeland. That just came to my mind years ago when I was watching. And you know when I you know you put everything together as a writer, you have to put all everything. You know you keep these things in your mind, and one day. You decide. Okay, I have to write it, and uh, right. you do it. Yep. Um, um, I finished this session. This section of our uh, conversation with reading a, another part of the Blue Toucan, and we will open up for the questions and the comments. Um, they from the book. They the the Vietnamese in diaspora started dying one after another. How in their sleep. He was the perfect picture of a health. One night, he would go to sleep and never wake again. Absolutely young. One an athlete, the other a political 
activist, a factory security guard, a store janitor. They would sleep at night and never wake. Where did they go? They didn't die. They returned to their homeland for all that made them restless. Their bodies were limp and loose draped on the bed, but their souls, like thin white ribbons, would make way and sleep through the window. As these restless souls slowly ascended, they would grow feathers and wings and a big yellow beak, all of their chest covered with tiny soft blue down feathers. And eventually it became a blue toucan. First, it pecked at the clay rooftop. It was dazed and confused. It had recently arrived and would take a while before it understood the meaning of sky and the know-how of fly. But as soon as it got its bearing, bearing and knew its whereabouts, as soon as it heard the wailing from the room below, it would spread its feathers and fly towards Vietnam. Whether it ever reached its destination or not, I have no idea. After all, Vietnam is an ocean apart. Thank you very much, um, Hamid. And uh, we would like to uh, open for uh, questions and comments. Uh, let me ask Professor Yaqubi if um, I have the questions yet. Okay, I open chat. Uh, we don't have any questions yet. We oh, okay. The participants to ask. Oh, so, yeah. So we invite. So I, I, I would like to invite uh, it everybody if you okay. have any question or a, any comment. Excuse me. In the Q and A yeah. section. In the, in the Q and A. So down the page in the very middle, there is this Q and A. Um, you can click on this and write your question or your comment. Um, one question is, can we get any of your books in the USA? Well, uh, Hamid, would you like to answer? So I think Blue Toucan is available on the Mehri publication website. Uh, Mehri publication is in London, but you can order it online and they will post it to you. But the uh, books that were published in Iran, uh, I, I know that bookstores, there are bookstores everywhere. Uh, when there's an Iranian community, you will find an Iranian bookstore too. I know that two bookstores here in, Ca in Canada, in Toronto, they have my books. But uh, I also can recommend to go to the library. Some of them, they have Persian books and some of them, they have my books too. And uh, I don't know. They're digital ones. There's PDFs. I don't recommend them for uh, safety of your uh, devices or whatever, but uh, uh, you can find it probably online too. Okay, thank you. Um, Shola Sharifi has, has written my deep appreciation to host and Dr. Ismailion Neda Ahmadiani. Thank you too for being with us, um, Shola Sharifi. Neda Ahmadiani. Um, um says any well they are okay any chance you share the link okay i i can share this is the question that i can share the link to the book and the article in my um social media any connections that i can have with you guys sure mandana jafarian uh, says thank you for this talk Hamid, what would you change about the blue tucon if you were going to rewrite it I wouldn't write, I wouldn't write it, the whole thing. I mean, you know, it's, this book is there, but uh, it's about pain and pain and pain. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I don't really know, uh, but that's the story of the victims and this is happening every day and somebody should write it. So I don't want to discourage people to write it. I mean, you know, because this happened to me, I'm just saying that. Yeah. But uh, 
I kept writing actually. And now when I'm writing about Paris, I, I think I'm just carrying on. I'm just continuing my work. But uh, uh, I don't know. Thank you. I don't know. Yeah. Well, Shole uh, Sharifi says, what is the best way to reach Dr. Esmailion to ask our questions and have his comments? Oh, is it a question that you are you you you, you are actually um, here in connection with Ahmed Ismailion? Ahmed, do you want to address this question? Uh, you know, I have Facebook account, Instagram account, but I mostly can't uh, check the all the comments. Uh, and uh, so you can write in Facebook if you have any question. You can write it in in your on messengers and. I, I read most of the comments. I'm not sure if I read all of them, but uh, if it, this is a specific question that I should answer, uh, I you know I, I try to answer and guide you. Okay, thank you, uh, Emily. Uh, she says, Doctor Esmaidion, you mentioned you needed to tap into a specific mindset when you write. What is that process like? As I said, okay, you you as a writer, you have your uh, uh, ideology. I mean, you know, or or your think way of thinking. I remember once they asked uh, Milan Kundra that, "Who are you? Are you a socialist? Are you a communist? Are you a liberal, conservative, whatever?" And he said, "None of them, because I have to be. I'm an observer." I have to be able to observe and write about people I see, the conservatives, liberals, uh, communists, or whatever. I was like that in my whole life. Uh, as a writer, but you have you should not get any side and you know take this part or that part, that part side. But uh, I think when when a crime comes in front of you, you can't be uh, neutral. You can't be in a gray area. And as a writer, the mindset that I had for all my books is that I was not in the side of the uh, criminals. Mm -hmm. I tried to write about the pain of the victims. And uh, my books, are mostly they have political context. And uh, uh, you have to uh, improve your knowledge about uh, what's going on about around you in your country, in Canada not only the uh, contemporary uh, history of Iran, you have to go back to uh, 100 years ago and see uh, where we came from and what happened to us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sepide Mayer says, Dr. Esmaelion, please keep writing. Your prose is very touching. Thank you, Sepide. Jade Abedini says, what is your device for an aspiring writer in exile, right? What is uh, as aspiring writer in exile what is your advice okay yeah what is your advice for aspiring writers in Iran? like any other writer would say uh read more and uh watch movies good movies not uh there are lots of movies out there so uh and uh keep writing you have to practice writing every day like at least 500 words and uh, uh that's the way you know uh you, you practice and uh, you have to be patient to, to mm -hmm. publish your book. You should not do it right away when you write a piece in, on your Facebook. You, you have to be patient and then get others' opinion. And, you know, there is a process to be a writer. And for me, for example, when, when I started, it took me four or five years or more than that probably for the first book. And mm -hmm. um, so I, to have a guidance, to have an instructor, uh, would be great. There are, there are lots of good uh, Iranian writers out there that they can help you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mehra Kamali says, Blue Token is not just about Bahman, it is also about Simin. Can Hamid talk more about her? Her experience is a totally different kind of exile experience. If Bahman is a messenger of returning and death, Simin is the messenger of life and staying. I want Hamid to talk more about Simin. Uh, thank you, Merak. Uh, I think you are right. And uh, so, yes, yeah, Simin is a symbol for life. And that was un unconscious that I wrote that. I didn't know about this when, when I wrote it. 
I just had the characters in my mind. And Bahman, I think this is the difference between women and men uh, at the first place. I mean, the way of thinking and uh, the way they encounter with, with, uh, with the disaster, the way they uh, um, endure the pain. So uh, Bahman can't, um, can't tolerate this pain and gives up one day. But Simin is the one that, uh, that can, can, can like evolve or you know, can, can change things. And uh, uh, I mean, and now we have, we have seen that in the last 43 years, the women are the best messengers of change in Iran. And uh, I think Simin is one of them. He, she might be quiet at the corner, but you know the way she appreciates life. This is the way that you see in the in the face of the Iranian woman that they uh, stand up against against the oppressive regime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shole Sharif says, Doctor Esmailion, you are the voice of the witness of victims. Please keep up your strengthness. Razian, sorry, warm regards to my old friends, Parwan and Hamid. Thanks, Dr. Yakubi. And uh, she expresses, like, when are you going to write? What's your plan for writing the new novel? We are extremely waiting. Uh, hi, Razia John. Thank you for asking. Uh, and uh, as I said, I have two unpublished books. I've given that to our, one of our mutual friends uh, to edit it. And uh, hopefully it's gonna be ready soon. And uh, as soon as it's, it's ready, I'm gonna publish it in some way and as an audio book or, or something. But by writing a next novel, Razi, is very difficult, especially when you want to write about your own life. And it's gonna be probably my last work, I think. <laughs> and uh, so I need just two weeks, as I said. And I need to, you know, that as a writer, you need peace and quiet. You have to be somewhere. But uh, even now, when I was in this meeting, my phone, I had some <laughs> uh, messages on my phone from uh, from different people. So I have to turn off my phone, go somewhere for two, three weeks, and write it down. I would do that. Thank you, and thank you, Razia. Thank you for being here. Um, Zohre uh, Waezian, I was crying the whole time during your talk. I appreciate your writing in this unfortunate time of your life, but I love your courage for that Khahi. Thank you, Zohre John, for supporting. Um, Mehdi Emamian says, thank you, Professor Yaqubi and Dr. Hosseini for organizing and moderating this fascinating event. And thanks for Dr. Esmailion for all he's doing. I wasn't sure if the book Goma Siyab was published. And if it is, how can we order it? Goma Siyab has no fish or Goma Siyab Mahi Nadarat is published in Iran uh, 2014. But after six months, they said, uh, uh, you know, they removed the book from the, like the, exhibition in Tehran and uh, every every book is stores but it can be found in underground market in Iran and uh, uh, out of Iran I don't know honestly mm -hmm. thank you um says hope to see Dr. Hamed is my doing here in North Carolina uh, Farshid Askari says thank you to the panel both Dr. Dr. Ismailion, a very amazing, uh, very informative session. Thank you, Rashi. Um, Mehdi Emomian says, wish him, wish him, uh, of course, very uh, best. Please keep writing. Um, many messages uh, asking you to keep writing. Um, Shole Sharifi, maybe someday you will be able to write the ultimate novel of yours with the tragic story of PS572, it should be transferred to the future. Um, um, well, um, Roji Yar Puye says, a sincere thanks to organizers and Hamid for touching session. Uh, what we are missing is brave people who write the true narrative of history and readers that are eager to read. 
I see we are moving towards wearable communication rather than documentation. What is your suggestion for encouraging truth, uh, truthful reading and writing? You're absolutely right. We are a wearable community, and that's why something like Clubhouse is very popular among our nation. So <laughs> we don't uh, document things, and this is one of the problems. After World War II, they had to, you know, uh, they it was easy for Nuremberg uh, Court to find the criminals and uh, to condemn them because everything was written and everything was documented, even by own regime, like the Nazis, they had all the names and all the victims' names, what happens to them and uh, what happened to them and what happened to the bodies and everything. But in uh, Iranian uh, history, I mean, we missed that for a hundred years because writing was not appreciated. And documenting was not appreciated. If you know, you remember from your parents probably, don't write it, just say it and just be careful. And that's in our DNA. But now everything has changed. You have to document it. If you don't document the crime, and the best way to do it is a film or a, a movie or, or a book. And uh, first you have to overcome the fear that you have, you know, this empire of fear of Islamic Republic is everywhere. But, you know, first of all, we have to uh, be able to overcome on that and then, then uh, decide to write a story. And uh, you, you, you see what's happening to Iranian people every day. And in my heart, I know that some of the very good writers, they document that. But in my heart, I say, what happened to generation of the, you know, my, my, my generation of the writers? What are they writing about? And I feel so sad, I feel so frustrated. Okay, now I can write, but what about others? This is the duty on the shoulder of every writer, I think in Iran, to document the stories that, and, the, uh, and especially the crimes that happened in Iran and out of Iran, to uh, raise awareness among the world. To know, to, to, they should know the, the same way they know about Chilean mothers or the, the uh, Argentinian mothers and uh, other nations, but unfortunately, there are just few people they know about mass murders in 1988 or uh, like PS752 or Blood in November or events like that. Thank you. Thank you. Nassim Mokarev says, Mr. Esmaidion, thank you very much for all your activities towards truth and justice. My question for you is, sometimes we hear that some victims or survivors of state atrocities or other forms of violence choose to write in a language other than their mother tongue because it gives them some distance from their painful experience and make the process of remembering and reflecting somehow more tolerable. Is writing in English something that you might consider in the future for this reason or any other reason, such as facilitating connecting to non-Farsi speakers? Thank you, Nassim. That's a good suggestion. That was in my plan four years ago or three years ago before this happened to go and uh, to, to be able to write in English and improve my English knowledge or, and, but, uh, I don't have time to do that, unfortunately, but that's a very good suggestion and I keep it in my mind. But uh, for me, now writing in Farsi is the only way. I can write like a, uh, two paragraphs or three paragraphs in English, but writing a novel with all those nu nuances in the language, I think it's a little difficult because it's not my mother tongue. So, uh, uh, but for other writers, yes, that's a very good recommendation. Okay, thank you. Neda Ahmadiani says, Hamid mentioned about story reading, uh, story reading book club to the Iranian readers. I am very interested in books similar to what Hamid uh, authored and uh, tops related to how we can bring change to Iran. Are you or Hamid aware of anything like that going on right now? Um, uh, if the question is asking me also, I uh, would rather to uh, speak about this later, maybe in our social media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would like comments to speak.
Uh, I didn't quite uh, understand the question. I'm very interested in the book. I similar. think that if Nigel, so, can you elaborate on your question? Maybe she is asking about the kind of book clubs and story reading sessions in the way that, you know, is, is related to Iran, um, to Iranian struggle, something to do for Iran, not neutral. I mean, you know, honestly, uh, the generations before me that I'm happy one of them is here, Mr. Uh, Mandani Puri, master in writing, uh, uh, generation of uh, Shahriar Mandani Pur, Amir Hassan Chaltan, Abbas Marufi, Muniru Rabani Pur, and uh, lots of these uh, writers in that generation. I think they felt more responsible about what's happening in Iran, in my opinion, than my generation. I have a, lots of friends among my generation too, but I think the way uh, generation before me tried to elaborate that uh, is completely different. And that's why most of them are banned in Iran. I don't, I think majority of the names that they said they are banned in Iran and they can't publish a book in Iran. If you find any book of this writer that I named, I think you are in the right way. Thank you. Yes, Shahriyar Mandanipur, uh, a very well-known um, Iranian writer who himself is in exile now and uh, has written in Iran and outside Iran, I guess. Uh, Shahriyar Mandanipur, I guess, doesn't need any, uh, you know, introducing him. Uh, but um, Shahriyar Mandanipur, let me uh, announce that Shahriyar Mandanipur will be one of the uh, panelists in this series of panels later. Uh, he has written as سوق داد خواهی خود صلاحی ساخته ای و تا وقتی می نویسی شریک می کنی به قلب تاریکی um, I have told myself to be strong today شریک می کنی به قلب تاریکی و استبداد مذهبی در اندوه تلخت و داد خواهی تنها نبوده ای و نیستی Thank you, Shahid. Uh, uh, I hate Dr. Muqaddam in the blue token, of course. Am I right? Or I should forgive him because of his life and his all experiences. You should not hate him, Merak. You know, uh, the victims sometimes are in the situations that they blame each other or they take a, uh, revenge of each other, you know. Uh, Dr. Magadam is a victim too uh, in the book. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, Simin is a victim, Bahman is a victim, but Dr. Magadam is missing something, missing this, his past. And uh, I think he finds that in Simin's. Uh, but the way he tries to show that to her, I think this is not the way a gentleman will do. And uh, it's very, very, yeah, I, I think he's, he's not one of my favorite characters, but uh, I don't hate him. I just feel pity for him. Thank you. Hajar uh, Qurbani says, thank you, Dr. Hamid. I think undoubtedly in the contemporary history of Iran, you will remain as a myth and symbol of suffering of this land. Your activities are admirable. You are a great role model for us. Thank you, Hajar. And uh, Nassime Bastiri says, what have been the consequences of telling the truth for you so far? What is the consequences of telling the truth so far? I don't know. I, you know, I've been threatened on social media sometimes or the hateful messages that I see every day is on Twitter every day. But uh, it doesn't disappoint me. This is just the differences between people and the way that they're thinking. Uh, forget about those ones that they get paid by Iranian regime, the cyber army that they have. This is a part of it. But, uh, you know, people think differently about the way uh, they have to uh, encounter with the Iranian regime. My way is just seeking justice. And uh, I think seeking justice can get to a, to a common goal that everybody has about Iran. But some people t think differently it doesn't it doesn't upset me uh, but it's uh, unfortunate that some people they attack or uh but they're very rare i don't 
think that the whole nation or the people of Iran, uh, they want to stand at the side of the criminals. And they have showed that, that they want to stay. Well, after the election happened in Iran, I got lots of messages from Iranian people inside the country that we didn't vote because of PS752 or blood in November or things like that. People see and people judge. I think they're the best observers and they're the best judge of what they are happening around them. Thank you. Minu um, Fad says, Hamid, don't think you are alone in this hard situation. We are with you with heart. All of us Iranians have heart broken, but as strong as all this 40 years of dark times of Iran. Please continue to be voice of all innocent victims. I am pretty sure the future would be bright for Iranians. Thanks for your time and contributing in this webinar. Thank you, Minu, for your nice message. And Neda Ahmadiani says, thank, thank you, Neda, for being with us and for your comments and questions. So um, this will be uh, the last question, comments. We're going to join we are well Oh, I'm sorry, Hamid. I'm sorry. There is one another, uh, Hamid Farman. Uh, can I read Hamid Farman's question or? Yes, but if um, you go on, people are going to, you okay. know. But I want to make sure Hamid Farman is an uh, activity for children's right, mm, rights, and uh, it is important because um, we have lost Rira. Uh, Hamid Farman says, in our journey to justice, we which is your mission as well. We need a good piece of art, such as novel. If I am allowed to, I would love to see you as a writer and read your next novel in our journey, story of Parisa and Rira. Thank you, Mohammed. And um, can I say that Yasaman Bahman says, proud of you and thank you. Hope to see you at Duke University in North Carolina someday. Okay, Dr. Yahoo, stage is yours. So thank you um, to all the participants and the questions. I, I would like to express my immense gratitude to Dr. Esmail Yun for accepting our invitation um, at UNC and Dr. Hosseini uh, for moderating the panel and commenting um, I just want to um, also remind everybody that UNC Persian Studies has a Facebook page. You can follow us um, on Facebook. And we do have a series of similar panels this academic year. The next one coming up on October 16th is um, a, a panel featuring um, Omid Fallah Azad. And um, I will be in conversation with Omid later, we have Fereshda Molavi and Shahriyar Mandanipur and Monirur Avanipur also. So I hope to see all of you in um, our webinars later. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Saturday. Thanks, Dr. Esmail Thanks, Dr. Hosseini. Bye. <laughs>